Bien, euh, comme nous sommes euh, assez tard, ça a pris du retard, je vais aller plus rapidement que, que c'était prévu, mais euh, nous allons tout de même traiter l'essentiel. Donc, ce soir, euh, après avoir nommé lors des diverses communications les parties qui concernent la seule de Turin, pouvons-nous nommer le tout Pouvons-nous nommer l'ensemble donc maintenant, nous sommes, confrontés, nous sommes confrontés à un problème de reconnaissance des formes. Attendez, je vais peut-être me pousser un peu, excusez-moi, vous voyez, non. Un problème de reconnaissance de formes, ce qui est typiquement un problème d'épistémologie. Donc je vais vous présenter la suite de la synthèse que j'avais faite, la synthèse épistémologique à Paris en septembre 1989. Et euh, je dois dire au départ que l'intérêt de la méthode épistémologique, c'est que dans la mesure où elle est mise en œuvre dans de bonnes conditions, les faits viennent s'inscrire sur les lignes générales posées par la méthode. Donc, euh, désormais, euh, je vais traiter du statut scientifique du linceau de Turin, de la reconnaissance de l'authenticité et évidemment de l'identification de l'homme du linceau. Pas trop vite. Donc, la question à l'ordre du jour, en septembre 1989, était le linceau de Turin est-il un authentique ou un faux nous allons voir que cette question est désormais anachronique. La véritable question du jour, c'est, puisque le linceul de Turin ne peut pas être un faux, peut-il être autre chose que le linceul de Jésus de Nazareth Et ce n'est pas par hasard que le mot « être » est en rouge, puisque, comme je vous l'ai dit euh, précédemment, depuis l'origine, tout se passe comme si le linceul de Turin était authentique, et il n'y a pas d'autre thèse. Pas Donc la, la question pas trop vite pour le est maintenant de conclure pour savoir si, oui ou non, le linceul de Turin est le linceul qui a enveloppé le cadavre de Jésus de Nazareth. N'oublions pas que l'objectif et la reconnaissance scientifique de le, la reconnaissance de l'authenticité scientifique du linceul de Turin pour 1998. C'est un objectif que nous ne devons pas perdre de vue. Donc, ma présentation aura trois parties. La première, c'est le statut scientifique. Qu'est-ce que le statut scientifique Comment est-ce qu'on peut classer l'état du linceul de Turin Deuxièmement, la reconnaissance. La reconnaissance, c'est tout simplement la prise en compte par la science par it is the consideration by science and institutions of the reality of the shroud of Turin what is identification it is simply the possibility of giving the shroud of Turin a name ce plan met en évidence on peut dire les... This drawing highlights the elements, actors belonging to epistemology. As I said, the scientific status first, and secondly, the recognition, thirdly, identity or identification. But the other three elements that we have to take into account are media vis-à-vis -vis the recognition institutions vis-à-vis -vis identification and uh, the scientific status what is the problem the problem we are faced with uh, since the beginning is to give a name to the thing to name it So there is a phenomenon which uh, we often find in reality when, for instance, uh, we say, we, we tell a person uh, what What are you? The person answers normal. The normal thought, which is not uh, the miracle, is dealt with as an artifact. 
because it's an artifact, something which is a forgery done by human hand. So the problem has to be solved now. We should not forget that you have a black box, the black box which is the scientific uh, residue which has nothing abnormal. It's a residue which has to be dealt with during the performing of this procedure. And this leads us to the measurement instruments. You know that for every procedure you need a measurement device. So the interpretation was uh, left aside. No interpretation is there anymore. The black box is the mechanism of transferring the image. It is the residue we haven't solved yet. And then uh, you have five cases. Uh, the first one says simply there is an artist or someone who produced the image. Secondly is a forger. Third of all is a corpse producing the image. Fourth is the uh, Jesus corpse. And the last one sh which poses some problems is uh, it is the shroud of the Gospels. So it is the one which takes into account the last chapter of the Gospel. So the problem has been split in five pieces. Very quickly I would like to precise explain that this method is the scientific method, the Cartesian or the Descartes method. To go from abnormal to natural, it is enough to admit just what is evident. And here like to uh, refer you to the problems of 1989. So I refer you to the image uh, you already seen in 1989 showing case by case uh, the case of the artist, of the forger, of the crucified man and so on and so forth as well as well, the whole series of the research which was confirmed during the symposium and which uh, uh, maintains uh, all of those, uh, each of those cases. The particular scientific study tends to become part and parcel of a wider framework and uh, prove something. So nothing is given from gra for uh, granted. Now, these five cases, from the simplest to the most complicated one, they correspond to a logic that is if you take the first three cases, uh, one, two, three, the artist, the forger, and the corpse, uh, you put yourself uh, in a, a logic or a view of authentication. You try to understand the nature of the object. And you want to know whether it was produced by man, by a human being, or a natural fact. In the fourth case, you are in a process of identification, that is, knowing whether the man on the shroud is uh, Jesus of Nazareth or someone else. So this is a process of, uh, let's say, legal identification. And fifth case, the, the first case was a semantic uh, question. How do we do that? The triangle of the expertise allows us to know the scientific instruments, the discipline which can allow us to solve the problem. Science, as it is considered today, allows us to know whether we are faced with the artist's work or forgery corpse. But uh, when the time comes to identify something more, then we have to resort to history because we need to know something about the person or the character who could play, could have played a role. And then the last part of the problem which doesn't uh, affect us today but which emerged in 1989, it, it is semantics. That is the meaning, the relationship between one thing and the text. Now, after giving you the uh, great the key to assess uh, the um, Shroud of Turing, I can tell you we made uh, important strides. We have to move to recognition. The epistemological uh, summary I proposed uh, and submitted in 1989, and which is a demonstration, has the same power a demonstration has when you keep it in a drawer and you pick it up. Later, it has to recognize how the actors are 
in front or pay face with this demonstration. Uh, in 1989, we were still uh, in the hypothesis of the forgery. We have to say that in 1989, we were still there. Point number two, case number two. And we are there now. And tonight, we can even get there to the fire, to the fifth box. So I will keep on very quickly. This triangle of uh, recognition, since it's a sector of recognition, relates to authentication, identification, interpretation. Our his scientific history started in 1988. We hope so it started in 1898 and uh, we hope that uh, by 1998 uh, the authenticity could be recognized. We have to start stating it today because between uh, um, stating and uh, making it accepted a certain la la time amount, time, amount of time uh, uh, elapses. Uh, was correcting, we should not, uh, the, the speaker is changing, we should not read in 1989, but 1978, because this corresponds to the work by Sturb, which is a considerable work, who dealt with the identification of the cause of the image and the identification of the artist. I'm not going to mention here his works, which are, which are well known, works on the formation of uh, the work, uh, that is, the Shroud of Turin's research project, uh, allowed us to acknowledge uh, the possibility of the axis uh, who caused uh, or produced this uh, image. And then, uh, to be simple, I will just mention the second stage, uh, which was started uh, as of this uh, uh, STARP prop work uh, lead us to 1989, this city Paris symposium, which was uh, held after the um, evident uh, announcement of the carbon-14. We have to say that at that time the acknowledgement of non-forgery was given through an official document. Uh, this means that up to that time there was no official document uh, acknowledging, recognizing uh, the peculiarity of the shroud. So the um, shroud is uh, nothing which goes uh, around with identity card. Actually, it acts on the basis of its authority and uh, makes it known without showing IDs. This is the first uh, ID for the shroud provided by authority, by uh, who is, uh, in a way, Dr. Tite, who was obliged uh, during the symposium in Paris to say, I don't think that the result of the radiocarbon uh, dating uh, result uh, shows that uh, the uh, shroud is a forgery. You know that media said uh, that the shroud was uh, a forgery following uh, the dating. I actually tried to avoid using the word forgery, and I'm quoting here, but the description of uh, false uh, shroud affected uh, an interview I gave, uh, I had. And this is very important because it relates to the coordinator of the studies uh, who could not maintain his uh, thesis because uh, faced with his colleagues he would have run the risk of being criticized. So the next step uh, which is very important is 1990. Why 1990? Because 1990 During 1990, an important exhibition at the British Museum, uh, Museum took place, which lasted nine months until September 90, uh, the title of which was uh, Forgery, the Art of Deceit. So it was an exhibition devoted to that. We should know that the British Museum is not an institution similar to the others. It is an international institution specialized in particular on fakes a prestigious uh, exhibition lasting six months uh, devoted to fake 
which uh, calls upon the other museums all over the world and which is prepared at least two years in advance. So two years before the radiocarbon dating, it's a real happening, real event. The core of this exhibition was exactly the, the full-size uh, display on a slide of the Shroud of Turin. So we can say that uh, the Shroud of Turin is the most famous archaeological and surprising archaeological uh, uh, finding, the most uh, uh, the, the main and most important event seems to be the Shroud of Turing. Something very important happens. As a matter of fact, on the back of the prestigious catalogue of the British Museum, there was a, a kind of uh, blame or a claim, accusation, the forgers of the Shroud of Turin the institute itself which carried out the supervision on dating carbon-14 supervision the same institution which supported this dating was blaming the Shroud of being fake what did it happen? Sielt wrote to the British Museum and said, "You are speaking of. Are you speaking about forgers? Then name them." And the answer we received. Uh, we received an answer, and uh, Geoffrey House, uh, the director of the British Museum, writes us, uh, "In no way, all of the objects of this section are faked." So it doesn't mean that it's a, a forgery. It's a forgery, and to clarify, we were not suggesting that the shroud is a forgery. We added a label explaining uh, better what we meant. What does it mean that all of this is related to dating? So to get to go back to what uh, I've just uh, shown you, the back side of the catalogue. It was not uh, the organizer's fault. The text of the uh, editor you are referring to, of the publisher, was not authorized and had been uh, uh, published uh, without uh, control. Scientific authorities supervising uh, scientific texts uh, it took six months uh, to realize uh, this anomaly. And then we had all the references uh, uh, were uh, taken away from the back cover. So you can see, they just uh, canceled it. And this is uh, the result. Fake, uh, the art of deception. If you read the text uh, and you replace uh, they simply replaced the uh, Shroud uh, forgers with the expression you just uh, can read up there. Now, you see that all of the anomalies uh, which were submitted there and which relate to the Shroud, the carbon-14 dating, and so on and so forth, all of the, the, the figures can be deceitful but sometimes even the language can be deceitful. Now, to be serious, uh, what matters very much, what is very important for identifying the shroud, starts always from the accusation. This definition, the definition 317 of the catalogue of the British Museum I've just shown you, describes uh, the shroud and this is, and it is interesting to read it. How do they identify the man on the shroud? The shroud shows uh, dorsally and ventrally a man who seems to be whipped, scorched and crucified. So it is considered as the sepulchral 
shroud of Christ. There are two elements specified here. The shroud of Turin is uh, presented as uh, the shroud of Christ. And then the British Museum adds that the discovery of photography which, gave, which is given here and the medical the discoveries uh, suggest uh, that uh, the shroud could be reasonably considered as authentic. So you see that uh, the British Museum itself uh, having uh, no part here, simply the doubt that uh, this could be the shroud of Jesus of Nazareth. But there is a but, uh, because there was a carbon-14 dating, so we have to pay homage to this important exhibition, because if you want, uh, we were it, the first of all, uh, the, the shroud was considered a forgery, so it was uh, it entered uh, the exhibition like a defendant, and then it was uh, uh, called uh, a non-guilty. So this means that it is a f this uh, doesn't mean that it's a forgery. So this is the sub the argument which was uh, used uh, to. Uh, to write uh, to the British Museum and say, what does it for you, what does uh, the 14th century mean for you? A forgery? No. That's why they made the correction. The British Museum draws the conclusion um, using a theological, uh, uh, rather weird uh, subject uh, or argument until we will not know how the um, image was formed. The mystery will uh, still remain unsolved. A fraction of mystery for them is a, four, is a whole mystery. I didn't know that. Mais ce qui est très intéressant, c'est que euh, le premier acte d'accusation, nous l'avons vu lors. What is very interesting is that the first accusation, and we saw it during this symposium, the first accusation of forgery against the shroud came from Pierre d'Assy. The first uh, religious rehabilitation by Clement VII uh, through the correction of the ball of the 1st of June uh, 1390. The, the first uh, act of absolution uh, dates back to six uh, century later and then we have the one uh, from the British Museum which is which was carried out in 1990 so we have de la contradiction épistémologique. you see that the Vatican realized the epistemological uh, contradiction and we have to notice that the dating which was uh, uh, attributed to the Middle Ages was quite strange and it was used by scientists to start to work back, to start back to work on that. So to conclude the section about acknowledgement, recognition, we, we, we realize that from uh, 1989 to 1990 we concluded the process which can uh, which allow us to get rid of the, the uh, forgery. So no scientist can say that the, sin, the shroud of Turing is a forgery. And now let's move to serious things. Judiciaire. Nous sommes donc dans le cas... That is the legal uh, identification. We are in the box number three. It is a corpse. But a corpse uh, is not necessarily something which explains everything. So, a legal identification or judicial identification. I would like to uh, clarify that public opinion is not expecting uh, what uh, scientists uh, are expecting. Scientists uh, like to work, uh, make new assumptions and hypotheses. They are right and will keep on like this, but society will live in requires answers and epistemology allows us to answer a general question without necessarily knowing all of the 
detailed elements relating to that question. This uh, legal uh, or judicial identification, um, I want to remind you that this is a table that you make to 1989 relates to, so it says uh, it was uh, a crucified uh, person who lived uh, in history, so we have the word history. And we still have to explain and clarify whether he, it's Jesus of Nazareth. It is a crucified person anyway. So table number four, which was uh, submitted in 1989, which can give us the comparison element between what has been observed on the shroud and what corresponded to history. However, we made a step forward because since the shroud is something authentic, uh, we do not run the risk anymore of making any confusion. There is unity of action, time and space. So we have the classical unity. What is this uh, method of uh, judicial legal identification, scientific uh, method? The police since the 19th century owes very much to science. And uh, thrillers uh, were started to be written with the emergence of certain uh, pol some police cases which had been solved. The legal method includes three stages. First of all, authentication, then recognition, and then the identification. The legal method, uh, in order to identify a corpse uh, belonging to someone, uses uh, teeth uh, on the basis of the models uh, two doctor as and the other one are the fingerprints and the shroud is a print so the method of uh, legal identification through prints is particularly suitable for identifying the man on the shroud we have to provide figures anyway labs uh, for a legal identification use on the print uh, according to the various cases and the various labs uh, from uh, 12 to 17 points and we will see that we are going to that we will see that the uh, qualitative and qualitative sides are met because uh, quantitatively we quite satisfied all of the points and quantitative, qualitatively because the points are very important and meaningful you should remember the fact that we are faced with a problem of identification so let's go back to these points uh, we have already seen identification which uh, was uh, done by science uh, because uh, even the British Museum was obliged to acknowledge uh, that uh, there is no element uh, which uh, can uh, maintain that it is a forgery so then it is authentic if it is authentic a natural pr process uh, took place uh, which produced this uh, object is not an artifact it's not made by man by human beings but by nature uh, recognition is a very important point well, I gave you a three official document to Gwen Bytide, director of the British Museum, who tells us that this cannot be a fake. And then the British Museum acknowledged that uh, it, ha it was the shroud, but it was the dating which puzzled them. And then the Vatican acknowledged it. But first of all, I must insist on the fact that there is uh, but one depiction uh, of the uh, Turing Shroud which is perceived uh, by all those who see the Shroud, that is uh, Jesus of Nazareth. So all those who try to escape this image say that a forger imitated Jesus. It's an artist. Or the scene was represented, and, but always the same scene. And it is important because uh, 
depiction or representation plus uh, authenticity equals uh, shroud of the time. If you have a photo depicting a grandfather of yours, and if the image was not uh, faked, then the photo cannot but have uh, the date corresponding to the lifespan of that person. So this is uh, a clear method of dating uh, by means uh, of a depiction. So let's start from the medieval thesis. It's quite late, uh, even though uh, the uh, topic uh, is entangling, uh, we shall uh, examine the hypothesis of a medieval alter ego. So we should uh, make a choice between representation or dating. Uh, the second hypothesis is that we have an external contradiction hypothesis, so epistemological contradiction, which uh, I already stressed in the Paris Symposium. And then the third hypothesis, which is the 18th point, and that is the impossible signature, what we could call signature by Jesus of Nazareth, since uh, it is not possible that it be faked. This is uh, linked uh, to the uh, mechanism of image transfer, which is a contact mechanism. Then we have to choose between science and non-valid uh, uh, dating, uh, which is an epistemological point, and then uh, the fifth point, uh, which is uh, very important. We have an empty file, that is, we have no thesis uh, other than the depiction of Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, when in business uh, you ask questions, for instance, uh, If we ask somebody, uh, what do you represent, there is no doubt. Uh, if uh, we ask, uh, what is your hypothesis, uh, we have to wonder whether the hypothesis really exists. Uh, so, everybody starting from a given date uh, worked uh, on uh, representation and depiction. All the work was performed uh, on the basis that it was uh, a representation, a depiction. And this led to the need for something else, uh, other. So let's come to the medieval authentic work. Three points, uh, an event, a date, a representation. We have but one representation, that is the passion of Jesus of Nazareth. Since uh, the shroud is authentic, it's an authentic depiction of Jesus on a shroud, this uh, tells us uh, that it is the shroud of Jesus of Nazareth. If you have a depiction of Napoleon, if it is uh, a non-forged photo, then it's a photo of uh, somebody else, so it's authentic. But if we make the reverse, uh, uh, of course, uh, through this triangle, this uh, date uh, here tells us that it is a depiction of Jesus of Nazareth in the 13th or 14th century. A Roman crucifixion does not exist. So historians are going to, s to tell you uh, no Roman crucifixion can exist after the Romans. So, it's a depiction. Everything could took place uh, in the Middle East, so we need uh, a Semitic a corpse. So many elements of uh, which should be absurd to be included in that date. So, a person... ...because he didn't want to be in the situation of tight, a medieval uh, simulator could not represent anything else than the uh, shroud. So science tells us uh, that when we have a case, we have all elements, there is no contradiction and there is no other case, and science uh, concludes that that particular case is valid. 
Now we must speak briefly about carbon-14. Perhaps it was mentioned too much, but the contradiction of carbon-14 led me in 1989 to state three things. Uh, first of all, the Turin Shroud, the dating uh, is false and is unsupportable, undefendable. After four years, uh, an epistemological contradiction was uh, found, and uh, today the questions, the open questions, were closed by Dr. Kuzesnov, uh, and this is important uh, as to the simulator is concerned. We should not uh, forget uh, carbon-14. We should not forget the medieval thesis. A portrait of the forger was uh, necessary. He was modest. Uh, he had all the necessary time uh, in order to make retouches. Uh, he had added uh, something, and he was uh, the best genius uh, of all times. Uh, the speaker apologizes. He said the thesis of the simulator or of the authentic. This is, uh, would mean that it is an impossible thing because what is necessary for a simulator we must be able to reproduce the image of the body then we must uh, take the exact uh, image the exact imprints uh, and uh, traces because the image is uh, imprinted so it is a possible technique, an impossible technique, so we should not insist on this uh, thesis of the forger because it's like chasing ghosts. Uh, as to dating irregularities, we know them, so it's quite useless to to speak about uh, about this just now. There is uh, a lack of the report. Uh, lack of respect of the deontology of uh, scientific uh, basis, uh, lack of a report and so on. Everything was uh, mentioned in 1989, but it is still uh, a burning issue today. We have a current non-contradictory epistemological system. We have a generating fact. We have memory. And everything works, whereas uh, both on the side uh, of the fake or, or the authentic work uh, of the 14th century, uh, the generating fact, the generating event uh, is unknown. Therefore, uh, you're unable to determine the date. So let's take the authentic work of the 13th, 14th century. An identical scene was necessary to be portrayed identical to the Passion of Jesus Christ. Uh, two days ago, we went in the Roman Forum. We could have taken Julius Caesar and uh, cut off his head. Uh, how would uh, you identify him? A number of identities would have uh, been given to this head, so it's quite difficult to identify a person in these conditions. So in order to have an authentic work of the 14th century, not only an identical scene would have been necessary, but also a phenomenon of image identification, which would start uh, in the very same moment uh, when um, this uh, event uh, was taking place. Uh, like uh, when you go hunting, you must shoot while uh, the game uh, uh, runs, uh, while the game is running. So while uh, this extraordinary event uh, was in progress, a person witnessing the scene was uh, necessary, although the crucified person is not known. So a total simulation would have been necessary, Roman soldiers, uh, everything. And uh, an eyewitness should have uh, been able to think, uh, well, uh, this uh, uh, shroud is very useful. I will use uh, the flogging uh, in order to prove the authenticity of the corpse of Jesus of Nazareth in that century. So it's an absurd 
concoction. So let's go on. Here we have uh, the scheme of uh, the dating with uh, carbon-14, an authenticity element exists. Here we have the consistency, the issue of consistency of the thesis, that is uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And let's go on to identification. What we have been telling is already an identification process, but let's go to the end of this process. This authentic finding we have seen. If we call the person who used to know the victim, both enemies and friends recognize that the man on the shroud is he himself, so identification is a direct theorem. So everything takes place in this way. This is the judicial identification method. I would like to stress a number of points. We have time, uh, mode and action. Identification of time. Both uh, the uh, spots and squares are important. The 17 uh, dots are important here. We have a definition 317, which identifies a number of elements, starting with the face. And this is uh, the gospel, so we can establish the contact points by means of the gospel text. And let's stay, let's stick with the gospel since time is short. As to time, we have uh, only one spot. We have a flogging, crucifixion, and uh, the tissu archaic. C'est un élément qui va dans ça. Le blanchiment avant le 8e siècle. L'iconographie romaine. The spike. So we have uh, Roman iconography, the Semitic archaic uh, uh, typology of the uh, corpse, and as to place, we have pollen, burial. Hebrew, Hebraic burial, and as to action, you have the five uh, punishments. Uh, a punishment, uh, the thorns around the head, uh, and then crucifixion, and the spike. From the historical point of view, this gives us a unique context which is linked to the crown. Everything takes place by evidencing that this uh, crown does exist, and we have uh, the uh, wound in the side. This is post-mortem. It's not usual to kill somebody who is already dead. So this is a particular very special point uh, consistent with the gospel. And we have water and uh, blood. This corresponds to the text uh, of the gospel. And uh, another important point is that uh, it is a man. And this is also important, the majesty, because uh, it is uh, a face uh, having uh, the right aspect, uh, 30 years old, uh, high Semitic. The uh, corpse uh, was uh, less than three days. Uh, traceless separation, this is the 18th uh, point. And the white shroud. When uh, a criminal is killed, uh, he is never draped with a white robe. So these are the point uh, of judicial identification. The police are not always uh, this, not always have uh, all uh, this great number of points. Uh, this is what uh, is being asked uh, of our scientists. We are not supposed to be superhuman, but we must uh, apply the the resources in the best possible way, since our society needs solutions. So why shouldn't uh, shouldn't we apply human justice to the Shroud of Turin? So let's go to the important point, reciprocity. Police, uh, the police uh, 
fully ready, be satisfied with the elements uh, I gave you, but we have something more. Gideon's uh, point, the so-called signature, these uh, mysterious uh, scientific relic that is the imprint uh, of uh, the cloth, which is unique uh, all the world, not reproducible. All those uh, who studied uh, the Sindon said that it is possible to recognize a caterpillar after three days, but what the Gospel states is that we do not know how the corpse was separated from the cloth. Many physicians studied this issue of the contact and the detachment. And this is the signature I was uh, talking about. So in order to conclude, from 1993 to 1998, we could state that uh, if present science uh, submits uh, the identification of the Sindon to epistemological and semantic models similar to those already applied to science, it cannot but conclude that the Turing Shroud cannot but be the Shroud of Jesus of Nazareth who died around the year 30 of our era. Three unknown facts are still uh, at issue. The reporter we will be supposed to present to the Ministry, that is an authentication, case number five, uh, a scientific relic, uh, the uh, image transfer and the detachment of the corpse. So we have just two uh, unknown uh, facts, uh, just two. So the conclusion The scientific status uh, of the Turin uh, Shroud today, 1993, is the following. Shroud is case number four, authentic Shroud of uh, Jesus of Nazareth uh, with uh, a poor scientific relic. If we lacked uh, this uh, scientific relic, uh, everything would be reproducible. Therefore, we are left with the issue we had uh, posed at the beginning, that is the impossible evidence. Uh, and, uh, some uh, would say it's a miracle, some uh, said uh, it's a forgery, but everybody is concerned and puzzled because the Turing Shroud uh, represents an incredible fact, an incredible event, uh, and not a fact lacking evidence, that is the resurrection. It cannot be reproduced. And then we have the message, that is the imprint by contact, the detachment of the corpse, which cannot be understood from a scientific point of view. So everything makes us think of an impossible evidence. Now I'm reaching the conclusion, the scientific status of the Turin Shroud. is that it is uh, the authentic uh, burial cloth uh, of Jesus of Nazareth. The fact that some still hesitate to admit it is that we have an impossible evidence, and I put it in the so-called uh, uh, black box. Uh, uh, it is uh, a tool of deco decoding uh, of the mystery.